All right, folks, uh, thanks for hanging out. And I'd like to thank the hosts of the CBI, obviously the direct course directors. So this talk was what's missing in occluder therapy. So this is quite a big topic. So I didn't look at this from a perspective of really what's latest and greatest or what hole do we need to plug up with a new device, but rather what's missing in what I'm thinking of currently approved devices or devices that are utilized in the adult spaces, which what I treat. So I'd like to go into a little bit of description about what I would feel is really what we need to have in the future for the devices that we currently use. And some of the prior speakers actually hit on some of those points. So this is my disclosures. So occlusion therapy. So we know there's a number of devices that are currently utilized in the PFO ASD space, especially in Europe. So left atrial appendage space has emerged as a source of occlusion therapy over the last 10 years. And as we have, the prior speakers have already said, especially the watchman has been thoroughly investigated. So we expect further advancements in this technology soon, but again, could it be better? For the watchman, what's the pros? So it's currently improved in the US. Pros, excellent track record of procedural success. What's missing in this space? So the risk of distal perforation with the legs and an incomplete seal, and I'm gonna also add in on this with the, of course, advent of the thrombus formation on the face of the device. It's an important aspect. Even though it's a minutia of the patient population, it could definitely result in a higher risk of stroke. So I will throw that in as well, and I think that uh, prior a description of having a, some non-thrombogenic face of the device or even a drug eluding is a fantastic idea. So here we look, obviously, at the current device on the left, and now the Watchman Flex that's coming on the right. Now, the one downside of the design, initially in Europe, what they were having was issues with embolization. So the hooks that you see present in the mid-body of the device itself, what would be better? Let's not have any embolizations, because now that you're getting rid of the feet distally, I would rather not have a decrease in perforation to have an increase in embolization. So the goal of this flex, hopefully, will be taking care of both, because obviously, I feel in any skilled operator utilizing the, the current device, Perforation is less riskier, and we obviously try to plan on low embolization risk. That's why we like to do over compression with these devices. But hopefully, with the next generation device, we will see hopefully no perforations, and hopefully, the embolization risk will be negligible with the hooks that are present there, and hopefully, the device has been changed. What else do we need in these current devices? And you see on the left, there's the AMPLATS, according to the AMLET trial that's ongoing currently. We need SEAL. So Watchman's approved, but what's the, one of the things that we notice at 45 days and six months? We're obviously looking for a seal zone. We wanna make sure there's less than a five millimeter leak around the device, because guess what? We can say, oh, there's a five millimeter leak, but what does that do for the patient? We gotta put them back on their NOAX or their blood thinning or their recumbent therapy. It doesn't give them a suitable answer. So again, seal zone is an issue. We always like to emphasize that when you're deploying these devices, potentially over compressing, so get yourself a larger seal zone. Also, I'd like to emphasize, remember, the appendage is not a static organ or a static appendage. It basically moves, especially in sinus rhythm. So the expansion of this device or the appendage can actually create a seal. So keep that in mind if you're deploying this device in AFib rather than in sinus rhythm. So an imperfect seal. The presence of an imperfect seal can mitigate the usefulness of the device. It's painful to tell a patient after six months that they will have to go back on blood thinning medication. And I've done it, and it's not something you pr I'm proud of, but you wanna do what's right for the patient. So case reports of placement of vascular plugs in cases of watchmen and coils, yes, you can do that, but do you really wanna put a vascular plug on top of a watchman sticking out into the left atrium? And coils, I'll give people credit that do this, but I'll be very honest, all it takes is one slip of that catheter, and that coil is now embolizing somewhere you don't want it to go. So both additional procedures carry increased risks of embolization and dislodgement. So what's missing? Goals for future therapy. We want a reduction of distal perforation risk. We want better seal on the proximal portion of the device. We want risk of device-related thrombus. We really do want to work on this for industry's sake. We want to say, hey, is there a way we can make it less thrombogenic on the face of the device? And reduction of resource utilization. We talked about ice, but again, the downside with ice is the lack of the 135 degree view in the current standard that we utilize. And of course, delivering the catheter to the left atrial space. Do we really want two transeptal sticks or, again, a larger hole across the septum with another venous stick? A lot of people are saying this is not worth the risk of actually using general anesthesia and TE, so something to work on. Let's move to PFO occluders. 
devices that have been utilized for pediatric as well as adult space. So we've known for generations that this is, can be something that can be utilized successfully. Indications for adult population with cryptogenic stroke are rapidly evolving. So every day it seems like there's some more information saying that, you know what, 40 year old with a cryptogenic stroke with no other AFib issues, potentially this could be their therapy first line. So suspect utilization of these devices will only increase in the next few years. Current FDA approved devices, as you see here, are currently on the imaging here. Obviously, it's one of those situations where it's about user dependency or what you're comfortable utilizing in this space. But what's missing? Allergic components. Now, I don't have a lot of patients that have nickel allergies, but they exist. And it's something to keep in mind. And I think as interventionalists or as a proceduralist, we take this for granted oftentimes that we implant devices and then ask after the fact, by the way, were you allergic to that? Because we really don't ask this question that often beforehand. Anatomical variants, it's not one hole for one device. You have to understand that there's people with different types of sizes and obviously we'll need more variety in the devices we have. Again, device-related thrombus. Very critical that maybe these devices need to be designed so they aren't as thrombogenic. Erosion risks, and again, this is something when you put a device in a younger patient. Now in the TAVR space, what's the biggest controversy we discussed today? You're putting these things in low-risk patients eventually, what happens 10 years later? You gotta put another one in, or what are you gonna do with it? So just like this, when we're putting these type of devices in younger population, is there an erosion risk 10, 15, 20 years down the line? Presence of peristructural leaks, and the ability to place subsequent devices if there is a leak. And that's another thing, is because how many devices do we place across the septal space? Going on to ASD and VSD closures, current devices that are currently in use right now. Of course, obviously it's user dependent on what your comfort level is on utilizing these. But what's missing in this space? Again, the erosion issues related to the device and applicability to numerous sizes and fenestrations. Remember, how close is the VSD or ASD to the actual septal wall compared to there is a rim or no rim? Is there device related to thrombus formation and ease of use, especially in the VSD population? Now in the adult population, we often see VSDs post myocardial infarctions. Are these the best patients for us to be putting these devices in? And if we do, does the myocardium have enough stability? Is it ischemic or dead tissue? Will it actually seat this device properly without embolizing? So missing pieces in the left atrial space, peri-device leaks, thrombus formation, device-related perforation. The PFO space, the erosion, the leaks, the challenging anatomy and not requiring multiple devices. And when you go into the ASD, VSD space, again, the erosion, leaks, and ease of use. So my conclusions are the current technology is very good, but it could be better. Rapidly changing guidelines, indications for LA and PFO closure will drive the technology. So I suspect we're gonna start putting these devices in younger patients and patients who may not have all the contraindications that they have currently with the guidelines. So long-term safety is critical to the utilization of these devices. Thank you so much. That's a very nice summary. One other point is that uh, it's also important for the device to allow like future access to them because there are so many interventions happening these days in the left atrium, mm -hmm. interatrial septal access is uh, critical. And you can only imagine when we put a PFO or ESD closure in a 30-year-old, when it gets to 60 or 70 or 80, what kind of left atrial therapies will we have at that time? And do we have a device that favors little more over the other in terms of preserving that access. And I agree that the size of like a MitroClip 24 French sheath is not favorable to place across a PFO closure. So I think you're right. We have to keep that in mind that down the line, these catheters are large and what are we creating?